Okay, so uh, Dr. Naftali Fish, he is the one who started and, in fact, wrote a book called Nachat Ruach, and we'll mention a little bit more within the introduction. I just want to mention that quite often people say, I have everything, but I'm not really happy. So Nachat Ruach challenges the modern Western culture's frantic pursuit of happiness. It is something to do with serenity, peace of mind, or being relaxed or chilled, but it means something else. Dr. Naftali Fish is a licensed clinical psychologist and hypnotherapist in Israel. Dr. Fish <coughs> made Aliyah to the United States with his family in 1984 after completing his doctorate. He has maintained a full-time private practice in Jerusalem since 1990 and has served as a senior lecturer in the psychology department at Torah College in Israel since 1994. Based on extensive clinical experience in a variety of public and private settings, Dr. Fish developed the innovative Nachat Ruach treatment model, a professional Torah-based approach to psychotherapy, individual, marital, and family, and clinical meditation hypnotherapy. The Nachat Ruach approach is a unique and effective method to enhance psychosocial, psychosocial spiritual growth that professionally integrates Torah values and wisdom within the therapeutic process and relationship as a means to accomplish treatment goals, while openly acknowledging that Hashem is the source of healing. Dr. Fish is an internationally well-known expert in the treatment of addictions, including substance abuse, gambling, eating disorders, and internet and sexual addictions. He's also experienced in the treatment of depression and anxiety disorders and social phobias, OCD, anger management, Psychosomatic syndromes, healing and trauma, healing of traumas, and the inner wounded child, building positive self-esteem and identity, and issues of bali tshuva and off the dare. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Happy to be here. The introduction you heard. So I'd like to tell you about the first case that I had that dealt with someone who got into some trouble with his internet. And I think from this case, we'll see the basis of what I want to develop uh, this evening. Going back to the late 90s, when uh, some uh, Jews who lived in Zork got in contact with me through Zel Rabbi Zelk Fliskim, and I was going to Zork a couple times a year to work with the community there. And one of the cases I uh, wor uh, received was working with a couple where he was born in Switzerland. He had no Jewish background. He even had his uh, bris when he was like 20 years old. And uh, the wife was from Brooklyn, and uh, they, they had some marital issues. But what really triggered off my involvement with this family was what I'm going to call now the split between Dr. Joe Joseph in the day and his use of computer and Dr. Yosef's use of the computer at night to show what I'm going to call the dialectic between our understanding of the internet, that it's not a black and white issue. Because during the day, he was able to give much more up-to-date and uh, resource, uh, sourced out uh, evaluations, which was his main role there. He had, a, if you have a, had a question about diagnosis, something he wanted to know about some medical syndrome, symptoms, within seconds he could find updated academic, professional, uh, peer-approved uh, 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 resources that would help him make that diagnosis, and I'm sure in many cases that helped the person that he was working with be healed quicker, better, or not, not be healed, etc. So during the day, we would all agree that his going into the computer at that point was very positive. Now, he'd finish his day at 5 o'clock. He was a Bali Tshuva from one of the big yeshivas in Yerushalayim and was still in that process of being mitchazek and lots of things in terms of Yiddishkeit. So he, he would relax a little bit. His office was uh, underneath his uh, uh, apartment. And uh, he'd relax a bit. And his wife thought that was, she never paid attention to it. But one day she went down there to maybe say somebody called him or to call him up for dinner or something like that. And she found him watching a 
what, when I wrote my first book for Targ and Press Nachas Ruch, I couldn't use the word pornography, and in, in, a not, in a place that wasn't modest. Today we'll say he was looking at pornography, hardcore pornography, and this was, to say, shocking and, and w- to his wife and earth-shattering would be an understatement. This was the first couple that I had uh, where on the one hand there was dealing with the wife's reaction and which position to take. Today, most professional psychologists, including those with a kippah, and it doesn't matter what size, shape, or color, most of them will take the position that nishkefelech, almost nishkefelech. They can even, like Chazal said, you can make a sheretz, you know, tahor in 150 ways. There's arguments how it can even improve a marital relationship. The value position that I'm taking from, from the Nachad Ruach, Torah-based, professional Torah-based psychotherapy model, is to integrate Torah perspectives and emunah within the framework of, of the therapy, with which the client knows and wants to work in that way. And there's many, many, many people who do. So my position in this case is that the, fe- the, the husband here had a choice to try to get out of this addiction or to see somebody else who maybe would uh, help his wife come to terms with it, which I don't think she would have or should have. I'm not going to talk about working with these type of cases tonight. That's not my main goal. I've worked with hundreds of these cases. How do you work, how do you work with him? How do you work with her? Utilizing the 12-step approach and Torah-based understanding that we also have a nef- that were created by Sam Elokim, and we have a Nefesh Elokim. Therefore, uh, on the week of Yutes Kislev, to not only know, but have self-awareness and get contact with our Nefesh Eloki to use, to be in touch with that place within ourselves to try to overcome and be able to overcome addictions, which is coming more from the Yetzir Hara or more Panimi Tatoro, the Nefesh Behemi, with Hashem's help, doing our Hishtadlut and asking for Siyata Deshmaya within the Hishtadlut and beyond Hishtadlut. That's the treatment model. What I'm here to talk about tonight, I would say, would be more prevention. And uh, through the, the question of what's our attitude towards the internet. As you know, the Haredi world, for reasons that do make sense to some degree, if they were realistic, would prefer to still keep basically an, uh, an Esor on, on the internet. But it's not, it's not possible. It's not even a matter of realistic. It's just not possible anymore. And so... I think what we have to be able to do is have a way of understanding the internet, and by internet I mean social media and everything that goes along with it. I think we have to have a model to help us to understand how we can cope with, with this development because we're now, as many point, books have, point, have pointed out, we're now in a new historical period. This is not just a higher level of of technology, like, you know, we probably remember when the first color TV came in after the black and white type of thing. And this is a new era. And we, we see it already. What's happened in the past 20 years has just been mind-boggling how much has happened and how we've gotten used to it. For example, some of the things that Facebook has, has challenged is the whole concept of monogamy. And, and, and most people haven't <coughs> thought about it. And, one of the goals of this type of, uh, of what I'm discussing tonight is to give us some awareness of what we want to get from internet and what we don't want to get. That's where I'm going. Now, to get there, I want to use the analogy that I think is correct. I've discussed with other people, Dr. Tversky, who I'd may have a stream with Hashem, still be my mentor, and I'm sure many of your, yours and your followers, your followers of him. We're understanding the internet, when I say internet, I mean the whole, the whole uh, my record now, to be not only similar, but really be an example, an expression in this age, the Meshicha, of the combination of the bilbul between evil and good within the same thing. The consequence of Adam HaRishon 
eating from the Eitz Hadat was that from that point until Mashiach, there's a blurring between good and evil in the world. I can't say shotness, but there's an interaction there, and it's our goal, and what the Hasidus stresses is a major motivation for doing mitzvot, is to do what's called a birur, to sort out from the bad, the good element that's within it, because nothing can ultimately exist if it's not the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, giving it existence every moment, even if it's on the side of the non kedusha. And our goal, and the Altar Rebbe states clearly in the name of the Arizal, that the goal of learning Torah and all the machloket, sometimes it gets a little bit, you know, on your nerves, all the, the arguments, the machloket, in the Gemara, between this opinion and that opinion, and he brings it down. This is what Chassidus came to do, to show us the deeper understanding. What he, what he says here in the name of the Arizal is that the goal of studying Torah with all the machloket is to do this clarification between the good and the evil until we get to the, the final to Meshianic period. And there, there won't be a need for Birur, and our Avodat Hashem will have a higher purpose to do unifications between this world and the higher worlds. Now let's bring it down to, to ground level and our, our issue per se. I'm saying the internet is having this uh, good, very, very good part within it. Even to prepare for this lecture, I'm going to talk about mindfulness. So I wanted to look up a couple of definitions for mindfulness today. And within less than a minute, I was able to see 20 definitions of mindfulness that I can now share with you. And you walk out knowing even more about mindfulness and how it's defined than if I hadn't done that. How did this happen, though? How did it happen that the Internet and the culture of the Internet was able to take off like a rocket ship with without anybody really questioning some of the implications that it, it's had for our society. I just mentioned a few. It's known today by anyone who works or doing marriage counseling that there's a lot of divorces or a lot of marital problems for sure connected to uh, people meeting each other on Facebook. Okay? And I remember a case to show you how times have changed. I remember a case in the 90s that the husband came in and was not talking to his wife for like a month or two. And uh, the reason was that there was a fellow that was calling his wife every night at home on the old-fashioned telephone and having a f conversation with her clearly that was not about work or even making an attempt to show that it was connected to work in some way. And he asked her to stop this conversation. He thought it was going over a boundary of what was appropriate in a relationship between a husband and wife in terms of what fidelity was considered to be or monogamy was considered to be or what commitment was considered to be. And this couple, while I've worked with many who would have defined themselves as Haridi or Dati, he defined himself openly as being Dati light. And he, he gave his wife really a hard time that she was having the conversation with God, this fellow here, which he saw as being outside of, of her commitment to him and her intimacy with, with him at an emotional level, etc. And today, people have gone in without thinking about how the, the Facebook has changed the whole concept of, of uh, commitment and, and fidelity to one's spouse. I've avoided the, the, the Facebook partly for that reason. And recently when I published the second book on the internet and I did a new website, I said that maybe I'll get in, into the, look into Facebook a little bit. And I did it a couple of weeks ago. And since then, every day I'm getting pictures. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and there's like a picture there of somebody's being suggested to me, you know, some woman, who all I have to do is I can make a click and I have some type of connection with her in a way that 20 years ago would have been considered by most people, normative people, I'm not talking about really, really conservative people or fanatical people, outside of the, of the realm of, of a marital, uh, of what you're supposed to be committing yourself to in marriage. What happened 
was looking at it from a psycho-historical way. There's two points I want to bring together, but the regular habit that you'll get the main idea. One is that Sigmund Freud, as we all know, he's one of our Kevra, his theory had a very, very big impact on the 20th century, and particularly what happened after the 60s. The, 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 the 60s generation, the 70s, I think most people here were there, or close to there. And that whole hippie thing, that whole going against the, 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 what they called the straight world then, was really a, a knockout on what was the Puritan ethic that with America's being the rock and roll and the roaring 20s, it still was, from Freud's point of view, a society that had a secular superego. Freud's critique, the regular HUD, which was appropriate in 20th century Austria-Hungary, which saw all pleasure from a non-Jewish viewpoint as being evil, he understood that within this conflict in the psyche between the ego and superego, which is very, it probably taken from the Ravak between the Nefesh Behemoth and Nefesh Elohid. He just took out of Adam, Aleph Dalad Mem, he took out the Aleph, which is a Kadosh Yud Yud Vav, it's Yud Yud Vav, it's 26, Siman, it's a source for that. He saw the Dam. Freud understood the blood. He understood the Nefesh Behemoth. He understood the pleasure wasn't bad per se. He understood that repressing pleasure, which he called to be the, ma- the, ma- the sexual pleasure, the major motivation, what would lead to repression, which he saw as being underneath the symptoms that were coming to him in that period. And he wanted to reduce the power of the superego that society reflected, because in his world, there was a secular superego that also said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And we remember that in America. Like even now, you get on a plane, don't be rude. Almost every time I'm on a plane, one of the stewardesses tells me I'm rude. For I don't know, I took the coffee in some way, it was wrong in the middle of the night or something like that. So there's like a social value that was brought over. And Freud was right. But what happened is that his theory had a big impact later on, in, 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 the, late, after the, in the later part of the 20th century. And what's essentially happened now is that there is no superego. It's, it's exactly the opposite now. That whereas in Freud's period, in America, of those who grew up in the 50s and 60s, there was a superego that was internalized. We had, we had more fear of our public school teachers than, you know, kids who in uh, Maya Sharim have a year out towards the, you know, to the Rav. You'd never call a teacher by their first name. All these types of things. We remember that. Today, the societal superego is actually pushing, going away from what were considered to be the norms of the society 20 years ago. It's all, there's no superego, or is there a superego in secular world? That's the, that's the dilemma for the secular world in Israel and the Western world, every place else. Where is there a boundary? And just what's happened in the past couple of years in terms of the whole gender thing, this shows that there's no super ego anymore. And that's, on, that's part one. Part two was that the Western society was already in this place. And then in the 90s, the internet technology came in. And now you had like the final opportunity, really, to just act out your id. The id is the part of the person that's only looking for immediate gratification, doesn't look at consequences, is looking for sexual uh, pleasure. It's like driving down the street, like, you know, you still want to go back to like Ocean Parkway, you're going straight ahead, all green lights, no, no just light. no Keep yellow going. light. The yellow light is the ego, proceed with caution, the red light, it's stop, it's wrong. But you have now the, the combination that the culture has moved to an extreme position where there's no superego, it's now an id culture. America went from being an ego, superego culture, save and all those type of things, to a super, a lack of superego culture, which is now glorified and is politically correct and is almost impossible to go against. And within that, people now have finally been able to do what 
even I think Freud, I would, I really, if it was a Gilgo or Freud coming back, the first thing I would say was, are, are you, what do you think about what's going on right now? Is this what you anticipated? I'm not sure whether he anticipated it either. Because now you have privacy. You can do what you want. You can change your identity. I've worked with people like this. I'm doing still a lot of work with internet addiction. And I see the fantasies of people getting into that are now possible to get into because every nuance of a fantasy has been, has been discovered and now is available to people to develop and get addicted to. And there's no one watching you. Chazal said, in the name of uh, Yonatan ben Zakai, that halavai, that our fear of Hashem would be the fear of people. Now here's where the Haredi world's had a big problem. Because the Haredi world, which, you know, we're all in some way connected to it, to this degree, to that degree. The whole system was based on not what people think. You can't get a shidduch if, if you have a television in your house. That worked. But now in the era of internet, there's privacy. So in the worst scenario, you have a world without Kadosh Baruch Hu, and you have a world without social inhibitions. And the same person who walking down the street, if somebody, you know, I'm trying to be appropriate here, whistled at her, she wouldn't look. She might, who knows what she's doing at night, how many people she's talking to. Something happens when you go into the virtual world that you let down your inhibitions. And I, it happened in a way that, well, you know, they had a site they picked up last year where they found 37 million people on a website where they were cheating. There are 37 million people. That was probably just, just one in, throughout the world at any given time. We were making matches with others. Now, I'm still saying that there's good things in the Internet. That's the whole point of what I'm saying. But people went into it without enough awareness. There was something about going into the Internet that people who you, you would have thought would have asked some of these questions kind of went into it without, without uh, doing some type of cheshbon uh, I wrote in the book here, it seems that, that you're welcome to buy uh, the Internet Challenge, Jewish Spirituality and, and uh, Meditation to, uh, as Keys to Overcome Its uh, Challenges and Gain from Its Benefits. It seems that there's something about the Internet experience that disarms people. They tend not to pause and think about whether they're acting in ways that in the past they wouldn't have been comfortable with that may have been against the value system. It's kind of like when somebody goes into the sea and initially doesn't go in too deep. He stays close to the shore in the lifeguard. Ten minutes later, without having paid attention to it, he finds himself 50 yards from the shoreline. The water is now almost over his head. He's pulled from a safe place without even barely there was an undertow. It seems like there's an internet mindset that avoids looking at and dealing with what are future consequences of what one is doing. So what I'm advocating, and this is based on working with so many people who've run into uh, uh, difficulties here, is that we utilize the questionnaire that I've developed, you can find it from someplace else, where all of us who go into the media have decided in advance some very, very basic questions. What do we want to gain from it? What don't we want to gain from it? And as someone who, who uh, works with addictions, being aware of a tendency to be in denial about these things. That even when you, you know, a guy can be drinking two bottles of uh, whiskey a day and say he's not an alcoholic. So we need to be checking up on ourselves and even sometimes have a partner or, or, or to, who's giving us feedback. You know, Shlomi, I think you're going, you know, you said you want to limit yourself to one hour a night and you spent four hours last night and that wasn't the first time. Some of the questions that I'm suggesting to ask, and I thought this was a very practical for, for the group now, for what purposes do you want to use the internet and social media, etc., etc.? For what purposes do you not want to use the internet and why? And then it goes into why you think you don't want to, it takes up too much time, it takes away from family time, you feel losing control, developing relationships that you think about or you're not so comfortable with. How, do, how often do you find yourself using the internet and social media in ways that you don't want to? Divide your internet and social media into three categories, green light, vita, all the time, yellow light, sometimes, red light, never. 
And when you find yourself going over boundaries here, are you, are you finding yourself going over boundaries that you, you know, that you said you wouldn't go, and you are. And I put in bold print here. Don't be afraid to look at this. Because denial is one of the biggest problems of people going to addictions. People can be denying what, what's so obvious, and that's why you need someone else who's kind of monitoring you in a certain way. In general, what do you gain from using your internet and social media, and what are you losing? And then afterwards, I write here that What is important to know how, why it's important to know how to utilize technologies in a constructive way to stay clean. That is all the filters and having filters to make it less challenging. That's not going to be enough for people, a lot of people. It's even more important to have a worldview that provides a very clear reason why to stay clean and provides a satisfying alternative concerning how to meet basic needs that people are trying to fulfill through internet interactions. Being as I work with the 12 steps and also Torah perspectives on the recovery, I came to the clarity once that the 12 steps, if someone, pe people know this program, shows us how to stay clean. The Torah tells us why to stay clean. We have a higher purpose, we're created with Samuel Kim, and we, we want the world, we are here to make the world more of a place for Hashem's dwelling, the uh, Kedoshim to you, the Chula. So this is, um, this is part one. That in summary, we can't avoid the internet. The challenge is how to use it in the right way, understanding it's like the Eitz Hadat Tovara, and to know for ourselves wh what we want to get from it, what we don't want to get, how it's connected to our value system, and when we might start finding ourselves going against our value system and not going into denial, which is, again, the big trick, because a lot of times, again, that's the nature of the phenomena. What are people going on? What are people looking for that gets them into trouble? What is it that they're looking for? So what I tried to do here is say that we're going to, we're going to see what people are trying to meet from a point of view of psychology. Basic human needs like having pleasure. We don't have to... See. By Torah, Adam lo nevra ele litaneg. That's how the Ramcha starts Derech Mesut Yesharim and Derech Hashem. Now, those are major books of Musar. We understand in the deepest way that the world was created so that we would have pleasure in this world. How? Having a relationship with Kadosh Baruch Hu in this world, ultimately the next world. How do we do that? Through Torah Mitzvot, which gives us the boundaries, which gives us the recipe, which gives us the framework to understand how to do this Birur, how to have pleasure in the right way and not the wrong way. So, the, so what we see is people are trying to have pleasure. That pleasure principle was taken out of the, any uh, restrictions. The goal is how to have pleasure in the right way. Two, people are looking for relationships. Remember when they talked about all the lonely people? I don't think anybody is lonely in the way that the Beatles meant, or doesn't have to be, because on Facebook, I could have had already, like, within a couple of weeks, I don't know, 500 friends, you know? And, uh, and the good side of it is we all have relatives, I have a brother in the States, I have a son in the States now, I have a grandson. I can see him on WhatsApp and not even have to pay a cent for it. Remember making a phone call even in the 90s here? So you can see people now. I can now make contact with friends I haven't seen in 20 years. Hi, Alan Perlberg, how you doing? I can see them. We can relate. We can talk to each other. We really can connect to WhatsApp in a way that's really meaningful. And, and it's great to do these type of things but we can also get in trouble. So we have to know how to have relationships in the right way, how to have pleasure in the right way. And ultimately, this has to come down to a spiritual foundation that the, way that the, the right way has pleasure. wants us, not allows us, wants us to have pleasure. And sometimes the Torah world, in its reaction against the other side has gone the other way to make it seem like we're not supposed to have pleasure, but we are supposed to have pleasure. And that even in, in, the, in the way that a, a person is born, I saw from art school itself that, it, that the reason that this pleasure is an end, so that it, it's a pleasure in that act, is Hashem knew this way people would do it, and this way there would be a creation. But 
physically, once you've had the end of that pleasure, you no longer you no longer can have a child. In other words, it's all connected to the possibility to have a child, even though you're able to have relationships, not only for that reason, but that's a major reason. So the challenge now here is how to have relationships in the right way. In terms of relationships, the Alter Rebbe says, the, the true way, it's one of the most important things he says in the Tanya, which is very, very bringing things down from Lamala, Lamata, Lamata, Lamala type of things. He says the true way to have love and, a, and an intimate relationship is to see the other person's nefesh eloke. To see the other person, for, to look at a person, even for five seconds, and see that per, your spouse's nefesh eloke once a day. He says that's the true basis to being able to have love and connection and the Sheva Brachot. The Sheva Brachot that we say it every way is not from Hollywood. It's not modern. It's not, you know, from uh, some movie. This is the ultimate un- understanding of, of love and all the all the, the expressions that, that are given there. So we need to have learn how to have pleasure in the right way and on the side of Kedusha and ultimately that means Dvekut. Being able to have more of a sense of personal relationship with Kadosh Brachot which we'll talk about when we get to the meditation in a few minutes. And uh, relationships, not having fake relationships, having real relationships, having relationships that w- where there's commitment. Today we don't know what's going to happen. Today kids are growing up seeing literally thousands and thousands of pictures of, 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 that are not modest, and they're going to, at 20 years old, going to get married and then just be able to be with the wife, I get a lot of cases where people tell me this is their problem. They got so connected to it before they got married, talking openly now, they can't, they can't just even imagine just being you know, just with their, their partner. They've seen too many pictures, and even if they don't want to see them, the pictures are still there. And, um, and uh, you know, the monogamy part we talked about already in terms of no, see, no boundaries, everybody showing off you know, everything they do to everybody else. There's like no privacy anymore in, in, any, in any way. That's th- th- what I wanted to stress in part one. Now, how does meditation come into this? What I'm, what I'm s- stressing is that meditation is the way that we can, one way, that we can maintain some balance as the world has become so external and so superficial and so uh, insane in many ways, we need to have a way to maintain our balance. Balance is understood to be health. All systems of health have to do with maintaining the right balance. So we're out of balance. We're, we're too ac- externally oriented and we need to be able to go inside. Through a very simple meditation, which if you give me permission to do with the group for about 10 minutes at the end, you'll see a very, very simple way, but helpful way, a pleasant way, and a way that you have a positive impact afterwards, how to take a time out once a week is also good. More than once a week is even better. And it's based on a couple of techniques that, uh, that I've put together in what I call the Nachat Ruach, meditation. So that's what we're going to look at now. Now meditation has usually been associated with the East and that's where it was developed. We have a lot of interesting sources how it has a connection with Abraham Avinu and the sons of the Pelagishim that he sent to, to the East and there's a place in the Zohar that mentions this and very close. Yehudi, Hodu is very close but the, it's a thin line between Avodah Hashem and, and Avodah Zarah. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, therefore, when Transcendental Meditation, which was the first marketing of Eastern ideas into the, into the America in the 70s and 80s, he came out against, he said TM was, was Avodah Zarah, because there was a picture, you had, there was a picture of the guru, when you, took, when you, when you learned the, the mantra, you had to look at the picture and say something, but, he said, just be, using an analogy, just because there were people that worshipped the sun, and they were idol worshippers to the sun, doesn't mean that we don't gain benefit from the sun. So he gave a blessing for Jewish professionals to develop Torah-based meditation, which I knew about. I've had, 
I was very influenced by Chabad, as you can tell, but I never jumped in all the way, but I learned Tanya for many, many years. So I have my relationship there. And re recently I became more connected to, I wanted to become more, I saw the blessing again, I tried to connect myself more to the blessing, that the meditation that Nachad Ruach is using is, is, it has a blessing from the Rebbe that this will be a form of a professional Jewish-based uh, meditation. Now, the first step in being able to do this was that a doctor by the name of Herbert Benson, you hear his background, from Harvard, you now have them starting in the 70s, 80s, Western, high-scale Harvard professors and med school, etc., etc., making a bridge to meditation and some Eastern concepts. He took transcendental meditation out of its Indian garb, and he said, you know, you can take any word and say it 18 minutes, and this will set off a natural re relaxation response. And he has research to show it. You go into alpha wave, and he shows how people who do it regularly, which most people don't, can lower higher blood pressure and, and, and cholesterol and, and anxiety and depression. And there's, this is all based on uh, Harvard Medical School, uh, you know, uh, Truda. So that's one part of the meditation. It's l closing your eyes and thinking about the word Nachadruach or Tiferet for uh, when I work with people, two minutes, five minutes. Someone who does it on a daily basis will definitely gain a lot of benefit from it and you go back to daily life with more Yeshuv Adas and more Nachad in your mind and more Yeshuv and Nachadruach in your heart. Another, another uh, connection here is simply taking deep breaths, okay? Taking 10 deep breaths, breathing in positive, letting go of negative. We have many sources for taking deep breaths in the Torah. One is the Pasuk that we all read. Maybe we don't always read or remember Rashi on it. When the Pasuk, Vayishma, when Moshe Rabbeinu is about, he's about, he's been told by Hashem, now's the time to leave Mitzrayim. He comes to Am Yisrael and he's giving them the Besarot Tovot. What was their response? Velo Shamu El Moshe Mei Kotzer Ruach. They didn't hear this Besarot Tovot. Like you tell people they're in debt a million dollars tomorrow, everybody's going to give get a million dollars from some big veer and no one budges. They, that's the slave mentality. Lo shamu mekotzeruch. Rashi on this says, this is our connection. Kol mishen meitzar, nishmato v'ruchol, kol mishen meitzar, ruchol v'nishmato tzara, v'lo yichol arich v'nishmato. Everyone who's in a place of nacha, of kotzeruch, which is the opposite of nachadruch, isn't able to hear. I hear you. Right? That's now everybody talks. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I hear. I don't hear what you're saying. Not literally. I understand what you're saying. So they were in such a state of anxiety and, 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 and fear that they weren't able to hear this uh, uh, great news they were just being given. So one part of the meditation is just sitting still. That's the mindfulness part of it. The second part is taking deep breaths, breathing in positive, letting go of negative. Reb Nachman stresses the, the value of groaning when you, when you do, when you, when you breathe out. Breathe in. Now, I'm going to show you what it means, but it seems a little embarrassing, but it, this is really what helps. Oh, you know, let it out. Oi. Oh. I tell some of this for Do you have a lot on us, but we know how to say oi. I don't know if you have something equivalent to oi. And, um, that's, that's, that's very helpful. And also in daily life. Like before I came here, I a little, you want to get centered. I took uh, four deep breaths. I live in the area. I told, uh, I told the Rav that uh, for years I would take a walk around here on Shabbat and I come into this courtyard. I do a little hit by the do, talk to Hashem for five minutes, look at the sky. It's, it's one of the highlights of my uh, Shabbat. The meditation at the spiritual level is a combination of hit boninut that the Alter Rebbe advocates. The main part of Tanya is based on the Rambam, 
The, the Ram, we give the Rambam the, the major source for the Alter Rabbi. The Rambam teaches in, in, Mish, in Mishnah Torah, Halacha now, not Makshava. We have a mitzvah to love Hashem and fear Hashem. How do we fulfill this mitzvah of loving Hashem? Everyone asks, you can tell me to do something. How can you tell me to love Hashem? And he brings down the way to love Hashem is litbonen, to contemplate on the wisdom that we see in nature. You're looking at the stars, and next time you're in the desert, you look at the stars, or think about your brain and how just what's going on right now in our heart and how it's all working, and one little tip, and you're like in trouble. He says, when you, th- this is now what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. Think in a positive way, and this will set off the love for Hashem and fear for Hashem in the same, in the same teaching, the same process hit Bonanus. The Rebbe deepens it. He says, when you, are hit, when you contemplate, you're arousing the natural love that every Jew has in the Nefesh Eloki as a Yerusha from the Avot. Our Ahavat Hashem and our Yerat Hashem is not something from the outside that we bring in. It's from the inside that's always there that we have to uncover. That's the whole point of the Tanya. And the way of, of uncovering this love is through Hitbonenut. That arouses love of Hashem. And I want to suggest that Reb Nachman, of course, most people are either on one side or the other side, but I'm an integrated person, and I'm, I'm connected to both. So Reb Nachman, I think, has... One of the greatest things that Reb Nachman advocated was Hitbo Didut. I talk about the era, of, the era of internet. Talk about the mass society. Talk about people not being in touch with themselves. Talk about the, 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 the religious world placing so much emphasis on external. This hat, that direction, this shirt. I understand it all. I had, this, I had you know, a, a man that came to me that grew up Hasidic, went Litai, something usually we think it goes the other way, and for years he had to wear strimal to all his smachot because his, he would kill his father if he took off a, didn't have a strimal. It's There's something to it, but Reb Nachman is getting back, it's not political, it's not external, it's not, it's you talking to Kadosh Baruch Hu. Freud, what Freud did was bring out Hitbo de Dut when you're lying on, the, on your back there, you're not seeing the therapist and you're given permission to, to get out all your thoughts and free association and don't worry whether it's politically correct or not. That's what Hitbo to do this. Be real. Talk to Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Question Hashem. Ask Hashem. Talk, don't hide, your, hide your, uh, uh, your, your limitations. He teaches, if you, if you judge yourself now, you won't be judged afterwards, in that same point. So, hit bo to do, even two minutes a day. When they say an hour a day, I think that's, this, that's taking away, it's making it against something that most people can't do. Two minutes a day, talk to Hashem, and within a meditative state, I think it's a chidush. I think to talk to Hashem within a meditative state, for like one minute, two minutes, people find very, very helpful. So, the meditation has these elements, just sitting still in the present moment, which is called mindfulness. And that's a whole big, big uh, inyan in America. All the executives say, I start my day by mindfulness, Ex- meditation. Taking deep breaths, focusing on the word, nachat ruach, for a couple of minutes. We're going to do the whole thing within 10 minutes, 12 minutes at the most. And then when you're in a little deeper state, one minute talking to yourself, because our most important relationship is with ourself, and then talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I think that people do this, well, and, and they are aware of what they want to get from and not get from, from the internet, will find that they're able to utilize the, um, the internet and also the social media in, uh, in a positive way. And I want to give Rav, uh, in all fairness, I want to give Rav Arya Kaplan the credit he deserves when in the 70s he um, gave us from his uh, mammoth uh, encyclopedic knowledge of Torah 
and get with mammoth sources, it would read any academic s- uh, setting, showed us that the history of, of meditation, I'll just give you two examples. Yitzhak, Yitzhak, Latsuch, Besadeh, the Sforno says he was meditating there. Not only was he having Mincha, but he was meditating. The Rambam we talked about, that's the meditation. Everyone knows in Brachot the Chassidim Roshanim prepared for their tefillah for one hour, <laughs> then they davened for an hour, and then they did something after for an hour. It's clear that they were doing meditation. Rav Arya Kaplan brings all the Nebuahs based on meditation, and Ramcha also stresses that. Well, there was the Kabbalistic, the higher Kabbalistic meditations that we know about to the Arizal, and it was then brought down by the Hasidim uh, through Reb Nachman and through, uh, through the Alter Rebbe. Then in the 19th century, early 20th century, when, when, the, when the Yiddishkeit had to prove itself to be more rational, because that was the world was rational then, it was downplayed. But in recent years, it's come out. And we see on every, every movement, the Jews are there, and it's this meditation, that meditation. So it's, uh, we can gain it ideally from our own sources. So I can take some questions now, or we can do the meditation. I, I think it's best to, to, to do the meditation, and we'll stay within our time frame of one hour, basically. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to talk in my meditative, uh, uh, more meditative uh, tone. You get, uh, you get some adrenaline when you get up in front of an audience. You want to say a certain amount within a certain period of time. So I think I'm, what I, let's see, can, can you see me from here? Because yeah. if I'm sitting down, I think it's also what first. What I'm going to do is tell you what what the stages are. First, I'm going to suggest just watch you at the beginning. Just to sit still with your hands straight, not folded, your legs not folded. Just sit still, and then I'm going to suggest that you take deep breaths. Now, every, this will be like a practice for you. Okay. When I say deep breath, this can get very complicated, but something simple is still very, very helpful. For sure, love the abide. A deep breath is taking a breath from inside, from your, your, your lower your stomach, breathing in slowly and consciously through your nose, holding it for a couple seconds. Holding is important. And then letting go through your mouth, Everybody try it. Breathe in. <coughs> Let go. Good. The next part is closing your eyes and beginning to repeat the word Nachad Ruach in your mind a couple of times. And now repeat the word in your mind, Tiferet, Tiferet is in one of the spheros that's connected to harmony, health, the, the, the shurish of Tiferet is the shurish of health, bound, the combination of chesed and vura with, with chesed being stronger. So Tiferet is, when we meditate on Tiferet, our, our goal is to strengthen that part of Tiferet within our Nefesh So that's that's the uh, the mental piece. Deep breathing, the mental piece we did. Good. Okay, so we're going to start now. Now, anyone who does not want to do the meditation, that's your choice. I, I based on experience working working with groups, just uh, there's some tendency people don't realize that sometimes to talk to <coughs> other people who they think are not well, doing it. So just it's your choice whether to do it. Okay, so first of all, sitting still, and hearing my voice. Now, here, after the sikha we had about the challenges of the internet era and how to be able to gain without being hurt So nice to just 
sit still now. So, so simple, but so, so helpful. So, so healing. Refuah ta nefesh, refuah ta guf, now, and even more so afterwards. Decide that's what you'd like. Just paying attention now, this is the mindfulness part, just paying attention now to the present moment without thinking about the past or the future. Hearing the tick-tock. Having awareness without judgment of what's going on. And now going inside Paying attention to your heartbeat. With more and more awareness, more and more appreciation of just being alive in the present moment. And with more appreciation that every heartbeat really is the expression of Hashem's will that you, Rav Aaron, be alive and well and growing in the present moment. And even beyond that, every heartbeat's really expression of Hashem's Ahava for you as a Jewish man or woman created B'Tselem Elohim every Jew has a unique divine spark which is always holy, always healthy and building your self-esteem from that foundation that our value goes beyond our achievements. We have intrinsic value beyond our achievements, beyond our appearance. And when you're upset, when you're down, remind yourself of that. Now beginning to take deep breaths, like I showed you, breathing in, <coughs> holding for a couple of moments, Letting go, oh. Breathing in the present moment. Letting go of the stress from today or before, oh. Breathing on your own, like I suggest you do at home. Breathing in Nachas Ruach. Letting go of Kotsa Ruach. Something been stressful, think about it and then breathe in and then let go. Mind, body. A couple more times. Breathing in, Abirat Eretz Yisrael, Machima, Machlima, appreciating the holy energy of the sky of Eretz Yisrael. That's the Mahut of Eretz Yisrael. The sky, it's holy. You're breathing in, literally, Elokut, with every breath. One, more, one or two more times, breathing in. I'm really okay when you feel hurt by something. Let go. Let 
breathing in. Baruch Hashem, Adin Hashem. Great. And now the final part. Just paying attention to your thoughts, looking at them for a moment, Kino on the outside. People deal with obsessional thoughts, it can help too. Learn how to see your thoughts from the outside. And now, simply focusing your mind now on your new mental anchor. For one minute, I'm going to suggest Nachat Ruach. And for the second minute, Tiferet. And when you have other thoughts, <coughs> other thoughts that come into your mind, you'll want to, and you'll be able to move your thoughts back to your new mental anchor, to the word, Nachat Ruach, or Tiferet. And also in day-to-day -day life, if something hassled you, if you started thinking in a negative way or somewhat of a compulsive way, you hear my voice saying, take several deep breaths. Think Nachad Ruach, Nachad Ruach, Nachad Ruach. And you'll come back to more of a serene <coughs> inner place. And now, 30 seconds to be with yourself. Just be with yourself. getting in touch with ourselves without anything external. And now before coming back to regular waking state, when you're on your own, you can give yourself more time here, talking to Hashem, thanking Hashem, asking Hashem for yourself, for your family, for Am Yisrael, <coughs> for the world. I'm going to count from zero to ten. You'll come back to a regular waking state. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. From this point, the hypnosis starts. You go to this level, and from this point, the hypnosis starts. For anyone who ever wants to uh, experience the hypnotherapy, open up your eyes at ten, seven, eight, nine, ten. And when you open your eyes, you're going to have a nice feeling, feeling more and more Yeshua Fadat, more and more clarity in your thinking, more and more Nachad Ruach, calmness and a pleasant feeling in your heart, and ready to go out and make the right choices in the era of internet. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? The, the first section was the mindfulness. Just being in touch. Just, just sitting still and in the present moment and paying attention to what you hear. That's what I like to do when I come here on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. I just, for a minute or two, I just close my eyes and listen. I hear birds. I look around to see all kinds of trees I never paid attention to. Just paying attention in the present moment without any ju judgmentalness. This is good, this is bad. You that's being, before the breathing. That's before the breathing. That's getting centered. Mm -hmm. and, then, yeah. and, then, and then the breathing, the, the, the mental uh, exercise, which sets off a natural relaxation response. Again, if someone is doing it for more of a medical reason, you should do that five minutes, even 10 minutes a day on a daily basis. That's, that's what the research is based on, people doing it w with that uh, frequency. All of it. All of, all of it. Right, no, that just, just that one section. That, that's, that's a meditation in itself. Okay. Sitting down, and focusing, taking a couple of deep breaths, and then focusing on a word that, uh, that you choose uh, for 10 minutes. The word itself 
is not significant per se. Nachadvila adds to the meaning to it, but you could say one. You could right, say. That was step three of what we did. You're saying. Uh, I'm, I'm oh, you mean in terms of the in terms of the order of it? Yeah. Now, I, no, I said that as something separate. If you just were going to do the the the, right. the first the first step is closing your eyes, <coughs> paying attention to what's going on in the present moment. Then paying attention to your heartbeat. Then taking deep breaths, and then focusing. Or nachat ruach, and from that point, being in touch with yourself, and then talk to Hashem from that place, and then it's best to count from zero to ten when you come back, so you you, you don't come back and like it's just a, like a jump. But you can always open up your eyes if you're doing this exercise, and you know your kid walks into the room, you can you know get up, and it's not there's nothing wrong with that. Why is it more always more powerful in a group setting than it is? Like I, I've got, I've done by myself things, and I have like audio things. It's interesting because yeah, the conditions the here are like yeah. either the worst condition, you know, and, and that's then, the, yeah, and then with a group setting, it's always more Also, powerful. when I do hypnotherapy, I've seen people drop down like incredibly deep quickly in group settings. That's something to think about. Uh, huh? Maybe group touch? Could be. Could be. There's accumulative, accumulative energy. Yeah. Um, anyone who's interested to, to buy the book, uh, it's possible to buy it for me tonight. It has what I said that goes beyond it in terms of other sources, etc., etc. And uh, if anybody ever wants to do the, this meditation, maybe it's a small group interested in doing it a couple of times and connecting it to more personal issues. Some more questions. Yes. Um, so just a comment to make. Um, first of all, I just really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, small comment. I think there's still a super ego in America. It's just been translated to other things which are now trending. In other words, you're now not allowed to use certain words, you're not allowed to speak people in a certain way. All of that is super ego stuff. Right. Like if you do it, you Good feel point. guilty. It's just a very small comment. And you know, that's the super ego that Freud was against. Right. Because <laughs> it's very <dominant> authoritative <laughs> yeah, and, rigid. And, and rigid and, and, and cruel in a way. Right. And it's, and it's liberal. And it just goes to show that like, good. the super ego will never die, it will just always transfer yeah. itself to I, I heard that. That, that was, that was um, also good and to me to hear. I'm curious. Um, I've, I've been very involved all kinds of meditation, I don't know, all kinds, but I was wondering, like, where do you pick up all of your, um, you know, all of your experience here, or where do you put it all together? I mean, do you, do you have you also experienced meditation in the the non-Jewish settings and practiced it there, or is it? Did you I learned that, you know, in the previous school goal, I learned transcendental meditation. I learned transcendental meditation, and I, I learned uh, yoga at one point. I was doing yoga at one point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from there I had some, that was, that was the original stages. Mm -hmm. The other points were that uh, as I tried to develop part of my own process of uh, professional Torah-based psychotherapy and hypnotherapy, uh, Benson was getting, a, he, there was a big literature about him in the 80s, and, um, and the, the deep breathing, you, know, you see, you see everywhere. That's that's uh, kind of a, that's known in, 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 uh, in almost in an intuitive way. But you haven't like been really engaged with the more Buddhist side of things, or Vipassana retreats, or I haven't, I haven't done, haven't done that type of work. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done it with here, and but I've done it so many times with, with the people I'm working with that there's like they call it or Jose. When that, when I'm doing it, I'm what the doing it in a sense. So, you know, I've done it many, many times and you, uh, and it's quite helpful in terms of helping people afterwards be able to sort out with more clarity what they're trying to sort out. It, it gets you, gets you, your mind more, uh, do, do you find that like a five minute exercise can help them overcome the internet addiction? Is that? No, the, to, to, to help, to uh, yeah, stress that the, the way to deal with the addiction, I, I didn't get into. It would be part of it, but it would only be you know, one part of it. it. It's not the whole part of getting out of internet addiction. Okay. If it's really an addiction, then then it's it's another it's another treatment already with utilizing the twelve steps and, and hypnotherapy a lot of times. But it it will be part of it for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh? Yes. So um, touching on something that you just mentioned. Um, you know that the, like the original says that, um, like the Buddha said that 
uh, illness comes from certain sources or certain lackings that you're being your own experience, your own energy, right? And so, like you were just doing that meditation where thinking about the third to access the state of being balanced, but what's your experience with using meditation to, to heal uh, certain, you know, to heal, like I have a cadence or like a spirit or like even a physical malady, um, you know, does any of your work it, it does in, in, in the case where I use hypnotherapy because what we just did now was stage one and the hypnotherapy starts from what we just did now and a lot of the hypnotherapy is uh, he, healing uh, trauma is healing with the, the expression is the, the inner wounded child that's very often underneath the dis ease, even in English, it comes out dis ease, the mind body aspect of disease that the person is there to deal with. A lot of times it's blocking them in, in uh, A, B, C, or D. So the, the hypnotherapy is doing more what you were, what you were just uh, asking me, because it's deeper. To, to, to work with, like you said, working on. If I understood the, the inner world of sphere of within ourselves, I, 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 I haven't been using that in a professional way. Keeping it more what people are able to have the most people have the, under, have the understanding for. It. I believe repeating Tiferet, the, the, the concept itself, I think has, has an effect. And, and in, the, in the therapy, I will always say at least once that. We're doing our Hishtad Lut, and then we're asking Hashem for Siyat Deshmaya within the Hishtad Lut and beyond our Hishtad Lut. And I, I think the therapist has to see himself as being Shaliyah, uh, to, to help the healing, and not see that you're, that you're doing it. You're, you're doing your role, but the healing is coming from, from Hashem in the, in the most you know, basic shot way, of maybe the way Yvette Nachman would understand. It's just very shot. And I, I've seen a lot of really uh, quick changes working with people in this way. Like someone came to me who had like a year of hypnotherapy, a year of psychotherapy. She had a trauma that she was like, she got out of a vort, like a, she didn't want to marry the guy and she, she had a trauma at the vort. After the vort, she, she, uh, she then uh, de developed this anxiety uh, uh, attacks and, and going like withdrawing into herself. And then her younger sister got married and she went into even more. And I've been working with her for about, about two weeks and she's like already come a long way. She's come a long way. Uh, so I think it's when, you, when you, you do what you can do and then ask Hashem, and you know, even pray for the person you're you're you're, you're trying to heal. That uh, a lot of times you'll see results f from that. That's how, how I'm working it. Yes. Thank you. you mentioned pleasure and the idea that uh, certain pleasures of the Torah want God wants us to pursue. Then that be the case in your understanding that there's some pleasure, there's some value in pursuing that pleasure and how would you define that? Okay, so again, the Ramchal says Adam lo nevra eva litaneg b'Hashem The person well, Hashem's in the room right now He, true to in, in the, well, that's the whole <laughs> we're talking about Cloudy, with intellectual cloud he says ultimately that's in the world to come but Onik Shabbat is something that we should be experiencing. The Vekut is something that we should be, ex we can experience, and I've been, I've been blessed to be able to, to have that experience, and I'm trying to, uh, share, I'm trying to share it. I've been blessed, Skutavot, that the Vekut, Naftali is also Tfilin, it's, it's Vekut, a name Naftali is, 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 is Vekut. But that's really serving Hashem in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Yerushalayim. 
So, yeah, we're supposed to serve Hashem Pesibcha. Focus on. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. I, I would ask you more. Do you ever ha- on, do you feel different on Shabbat than you do during the week? Okay. Well, how do you so, okay? What? Yeah. What's the di- what's the difference? Go now and go now into experiential. What's the difference between how you feel? To me, the proof of Kadosh Baruch is Shabbat happens. Do you feel, so try to feel when you're, when you're you know, some people are more right, some people are more left, some people, they, they can get the onik from the, from the Gemara, I'll get the onik from the Tanya. But try to, try to experience a Kabbalah Shabbat. Try to experience... Are you saying that pleasure is cut off? From, but are you saying pleasure is cut off from Kadosh Baruch Hu? Who's creating the pleasure? A person sitting in front of a computer. You want to ask him to use it in a way. He's going to use it in a way for seeking pleasure. It would be of the sort that the Torah wants us to Okay, so that's a very good point. So so one of the there's there's two. I think there's two points here. One is what you just. Well, ask, I'm going to give you another response from the Ramchal. The Ramchal says at the end of chapter 1 in the Seros Yisharim, he says after the whole thing of, of all the Musar, he says, bottom line in our language, a person's here to serve Hashem, to do mitzvah, to serve Hashem, and the role of pleasure, the role of pleasure, and now he's talking about what we would call secular pleasure, going for a walk on the beach, playing with your son or grandson baseball, you know, reading a good book, going fishing. The role of that type of pleasure, and he uses the word pleasure, is that when you finish with that pleasure, you'll have more motivation and more availability to go back to serving Hashem. That's one of the reasons why addictions are bad, because if somebody can just, you know, once in a while do A, B, and C, fine. But once you're addicted, you've lost your free will. You've lost really what makes you a person. And the bottom line is the pain that people go through when they're in it and when they get it. But that, he gives a legitimization there, and it's overlooked for what would be called secular pleasure. You, the litmus test is whether it's if you go to a baseball game twice a year, do you go back the next day and you want to learn you know, more, or at least you don't want to learn less? But uh, be, try to be a little bit more aware at the very shot level of Onik Shabbat and do things that might be like different, but they're really very simple. Just look at the candles for, for a minute or two. Just look at the near Shabbat. Look at the Hanukkah. Look at the light. When you stay there for two minutes, and look at it. And don't talk, just look at the candles. The, the Hasidic teaches the light, the source, of, you don't want to hear, but the, the source of the, of the light is, is the hidden light so that was hidden when the first, after 36 hours is revealed in Hanukkah. The, these, are, these are experiences we can have in, in this world. So that's how I try to ask that, answer that question. Anything else? Being in touch with yourself, is that about just not having distractions? I think in, in I'm you know, trying to keep it basic to the shock, being as we're so distracted by the outer world, it's so, so simple, but it's so, so powerful to just be by yourself for a minute or two and just pay attention to our heartbeat or the thoughts that are going through our, our, our mind and, and not have any external 
a place that we're putting our attention, even for things like reading a good book or looking at candles on Shabbat. Just being in, in touch with ourself. And you know, a lot of times, like Rev Nachman says, the reason we don't we don't get connected to Hashem is we don't have Yeshua Fadat. We're we're distracted. And he said that, you know, two hundred years ago. So before if, cell phones. Huh? Before cell phones. Yeah. So <laughs> if you it, 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 the meditation that we did is actually very, very simple, but it's very, very uh, profound in a way. That uh, that we're just not we're, I remember even, you know, when, we, when the, te- we, the main thing was television, there were people who didn't like to be in the house by themselves, they just have the television on, you ever see people like that? There's something Dr. Tversky wrote about this in one of his books, you know, just being with ourselves. We're, we're, we're trying to escape ourselves so many, in so many ways, so much of what we're doing is escaping ourselves. And so we just get back to the basics. Great question. Yeah. Hi. You mentioned that uh, he's born anew being a form of Jewish meditation, and he's born anew being contemplation, which involves thought. But when you look at Eastern forms of meditation, they all involve em- emptying, emptying of the mind. And with no thought, you actually try to uh, vanquish thought. So there seems to be a gap between Jewish meditation and the Eastern meditation that people have brought back to us from visiting India and places like that. And the New Age movement appears to be perhaps a way to try to bridge what are really total opposites in, in, in many ways. So how, how do you propose bridging that gap? And do you really see that there's enough uh, similarities between the two of them that meditation can actually be used in Jewish practice to achieve a higher awareness of, of God? So, good, great question. I didn't, I didn't mention enough that in Rav Arya Kaplan's uh, literature on, on meditation, have you, have you seen some of his books? No. So, uh, if you live in the area, I could share, share a couple of books because he really goes through historical development of meditation. What, what, our, what our colleague in the corner mentioned before, when you get into Kabbalistic meditations, when you get in, have you ever seen a Kabbalistic davening where you know, it takes like an hour to, to, to say the Shema and the Esrei? When you get into that type of Kabbalah, it gets into... You know, we have a concept of ain't self, ain't self, the Kadosh Baruch Hu, ain't self Baruch Hu. Those levels are there. Those levels are there of getting beyond and Abulafia. And I'm kind of, you know, I do, I'm like innovative, but I'm also conservative in a certain way. I've stayed away from trying to do those type of meditations. Or I wouldn't teach people those type of meditations because that's the type of meditations that Chazal said, you should only teach the person privately. And we have the famous story of the four people who went into Pardes and what happened to them. That was understood to be a meditative experience. And our Devua was all, pro, was all in meditation. So we have that too. But we have Kadosh Baruch Hu as being, as being Baal Abai. Devua meditation or revelation, those are two different things. Meditation is something that comes from within us that we're creating. Revelation is God speaking to a prophet. Well, but what's com- what's getting the Buddha to a meditative state? We have to maybe define our terms, you know, in the same way, Vince, because what worth, what worth, thoughts that we're getting, who says that that's not a revelation from Hashem right there, if I understood you? Are you saying you don't get that in, in meditation? Well, look, the ultimate revelation, that was something that was imposed upon them from something externally. I mean, just literally, when you go to Himalayan politics, it should be deep. That means there's something, the person, this revelation came to them. They all experienced something outside of them. You know, you have these prophets, God is speaking to them. I understand what you're saying, but it seems to me that meditation, you're creating an emotional and psychological reality from within yourselves, and that's why everyone's experience is very different. 
With revelation, you can have a uniform experience where everybody sees and hears the exact same thing, but that's something coming outside of you. And again, I, I kind of see that as being this gap between Jewish forms of, you know, ecstatic states and like the Eastern form where everything comes from within. Yeah. There's something to think about more. I, I think there's a little bit more of that than you might be aware of. I'm, I'm, I heard what you said. If you some, sure there is. If you read, if you read, the, if you read the Admor Me Piazenta, who, who was a very important Rav in, in the Warsaw, he's one of the Admorim that stayed there. To see between the lines, uh, chose to stay there. He wrote books on meditation, and the and the Nachman brings from from Pasukim and in, in, in Tehillim that we ha- we have re- revela- well, our thoughts our our revelations we're getting we're getting remezim all the time is a big part of uh, Hasidism it deals with getting thoughts and you have to be careful you know you can have uh, think you you know the Mashiach type of thing but I don't think it's as it's I, it's a good question. It's the type of thing you need to do like a you know a dissertation one, but I think it. I'm not sure it's as dichotomized as, 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 as you as you making it. Yeah. I was just too close to the joke there. <laughs> uh, the with the this is a technical question with the doctor in um, in Zurich. So there is in, in sharing the story tells us invented or something, or are you saying it in detail? Yeah, that's not his real name. No, I don't name it, but just the fact that there's a doctor who uh, uh, became observed at a certain time, but it's not a known sensation to... Uh, yeah, they, they, they gave me permission to... Right? Yeah. So it's curious. Why can't Humpty Dumpty be put back together again? Well, it, it, it could. You read that from the book. No, I, I went to what's that before. Ah, ha. Huh. Uh, is that something that... I, I that think I said it seems like Humpty... Well, I brought it there, I think, in the context of the wife, the wife being able to... The dilemma there is to what the wife's trust has been shattered. The wife... I mean, 20 years ago, this was more shocking than it was today. But it could still happen today. Her trust in, in, in her husband was shattered. Now, for women, you know, trusting their husband... It's very important. I mean, it is for men too, but I think in general for women, it's even it's even deeper in, the, in their emotional underpinning. And the dilemma in these type of situations is that even if the guy is clean and does everything right, no one can say he's never going to have a relapse again. And her model of him now has been changed in a way that can never get back to the to the pure and the innocent trust that he couldn't do something like that again. And she has seven kids, and they're all young, and he, he, besides that, he's not so bad, and he's doing, he's doing rehab, and you know, he does follow up, but that, it'll never be what it was before in terms of that initial... So is this different than adultery? I'm not from the studies, but obviously there are people who remain uh, in a loving marriage, even though there's been adultery. Uh, not everybody. Right. So, but is this is a different type of epidemic than is there different ramification of right. So, our, what I pointed at the beginning is that our our society hasn't. I think also maybe t- well, I think there probably are sources from Torah, but hasn't really decided whether okay. this is considered adultery or not. In the letter, in the spirit of the law, it is. I think. There's also statements about it that you know thinking is worse than than actually doing it. When what's in your mind from the Gemara? Also, I've seen it in other places. But for women, it it broke it broke the trust that that is like it's like an adultery. It's like it's emotionally it's like an adultery because she's now been replaced by someone else and. You also said it can grow stronger. It's like anything, not even something as serious as this, but people can have, a, because it's not biological love, they can have a separation that's pretty serious, and they can get back stronger. Yeah, and yeah I've, I've seen that happen. Maybe. The, the wife, maybe. 
it, again, it depends on a lot of factors the there. Potential. Yeah, the potential is there. <coughs> She's not going to be able to, it's kind of like you lost your, you know what, you can't get it back again. Like, you know, in terms of women lose when they get married. Once you've lost that innocence, it's hard to get it back. That, it's more subtle. She'll, she'll never be able to trust her husband again the way she was able to trust him. Now, people come to terms, they cope with things, they become mature, they put things in perspective. It has something to do with whether he really stopped or didn't stop. At a certain point, you can, you can get divorced over this if the husband doesn't stop. And people, and you know, get, get, escalates in, in this sort of thing. Uh, but uh, to, to it, today, there's a little more openness towards it. Today, what, what, today, I'm hearing from religious clients, uh, someone contacted me from New York uh, about two months ago, who, uh, who was involved in uh, kind of a, a strange uh, in a, uh, internet type of, uh, let's call it a fetish. And uh, his, his wife knew about it. And she, she wasn't, she, she, she didn't accept it. And she was very happy that he, he was trying to get help for it. He was like extremely guilty. He had, he had guilt. He mamash had old-fashioned guilt about it. And, um, but she, you know, it didn't lead to a, to a, a marital a breakdown. breakdown. I don't have, you know, from an academic point of view, if I was saying it now in, like, you know, in a university, I'd be interested to know what the attitude is First of all, in Israel, how much of a is, is it, how much of a difference is there if there is between those who define themselves as secular, Dati, and you know, and Haridi, let's say, around this issue, vis-a-vis what? Uh, uh, vis-a-vis infidelity. What's what, what is it considered infidelity? Okay. What I'm hearing from uh, my one and only dear brother in, in, in the states is that this st- uh, who read the book was that everybody's like concerned about their kids, how their kids are being affected growing up in the era of the internet. And you know, how, how, you, how you prevent your kids from like by, before they're age 10 having, you know, being exposed to, it could be very disturbing uh, uh, violence and, and all kinds of things. And how do they, how do you raise how do you raise kids now? You, you can't just it seems like you can't take the TV out. You could take the TV out, but it seems to be hard to take out the internet. And I'm more wondering. I mean, yeah. I've done that before to people, and okay. Okay. Is there a theological reason for this type of uh, I guess a serious test that has affected many people who are attempting to be righteous? Is there theologically a reason, or is this another test that comes to us in a given time based on the error? So this I'll say as a, as a possibility and see what the Rav wants to an- answer. But it's known that before, it's known that the, 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 the final gula is going to be based on the model of the, of the, of the gula, of the gula from Mitzrayim. And Am Yisrael got, the whole point of the whole Inyan of Pesach is that Am Yisrael got to the lowest level of, of, of Tumah, the 49th level, and the whole thing of having to be taken out that night and the pa- was, that was the final moment to, to prevent us from going down into the, the 50th level of, of Tumah, which is connected to, to sexual Hashem took us out at that, we were powerless, powerlessness. What the program picks up, you're powerless. We couldn't get out by ourselves. Hashem had to take us out. We had some tzchuyot, but we couldn't get out by ourselves. So there are sources that I've read, Torah sources, that this is the final battle, the final battle between the 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 uh, Yetzer Hara and the Yetzer Tov to keep it in that in that framework, and at the last moment, like when two arms or two or two sides are arm wrestling, 
the, the poet is just like he gives his all out final final uh, attempt to 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 uh, pin the other guy. And then that's that's sources like you don't have to give everyone, but what what whatever you found like someone wrote an article or something. Yeah, or it's in uh, what's in the, the um in Maya Sharim Sh- Shomer uh, Emunir. There's um if if you want to call me, I'll, sh- I, I'll give you the source. It's a source I've seen from a book. A contemporary source? Yeah, yeah, contemporary one in, in the past, you know, 50 years or so. Yeah, the disc, there's a, there's a Tehillim that has at the back of it, and the, it's a final, it's like a final, something like, something, maybe, like the, the Malvak that Yaakov Avinu had with the Malach, and they were struggling the whole night, and like, and what, like at the very end, he got injured, and then it's finished. Oh, the darkest is time is before the dark. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, the yeah. yeah. Okay. That's I that that's the way it's looked at. That before the gula, when the when there's going to be a new world and a new light, the light's going to come down. It gets it gets to the darkest point. Yeah. I just want to comment. Ayat Shachar is a proof that we take who take the gula in in, in, st- in stages and not like a a miracle out of nowhere. Is that it, it, the, the light comes right after the darkest? I mean, we see it in the physical world, which helps us to ex- understand it and accept it in the spiritual world. Yes. So just a quick comment on that question, if I could. And yeah. I, I have a question to you about a practicality for when I myself, my wife, or a child, an older child, is on the internet, the things that we say to ourselves or tell oh. ourselves. But just a comment first is the Gemara is coming from Sojourn. This is just, everything will be called Eder by Eder. Everyone will be in these different places <coughs> as the, before the final Gula. And what the internet allows for is for you to be with people of your own opinion, talking only to people that share your opinion and stay mm-hmm. stuck. So all these flocks are forming, you know, and it's like, we see in America how it's so acrim- acrimonious, it's the, now the left and the right, where it wasn't that way before. So right. follow the Israeli model or something. Anyways, I, think it's, I think it's even worse yeah, if that would be possible. If it's possible. But, but you're not, they don't even talk to each other. Like, and so everyone now is only staying with the media and the entertainment shows of their flock. And these are only that. And, and so that talks about the internet that allows that to happen yeah, for information. And so uh, See, that, that could be an outgrowth of the internet in a certain so way. So the, 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 the Gamora says will happen before the, the Gula is there, but because it's enabled by the internet, actually. Um, so it's just a, a, a one point. Uh, uh, a question as far as in the past, as far as like, let's say, hopefully not addiction, but you know, wanting to have self control and using it for good. So in the past, I've tried for myself and for you know, like with other people in the family, I have one kid in particular that was more on it. Now he's thank goodness less. But uh, um, to say, t- try to decide how much time you're going to be on it before you go on it, and that that wasn't very successful, uh, you know, because partly because the internet is. You know, it's addictive. Nature, it, it pulls you to the next. It thing. is addictive, right there. Right there. It, it, you're on there, okay, but oh, then it pulls you to here. Oh, and, and before you know, it, you've pulled, been pulled off into a chain. Okay, that's the, like, like the nature of it. Okay. So I mean, from, from hearing you tonight, I was thinking, okay, maybe I should say, what do I really want to use this for? What do I not want to use this for? You know, and maybe to have some kind of parameter. Okay, ma- you know, minimum time, like you know, I'd like to be around five or ten minutes or half an hour. And that, how how old is your really how old is your your son or the one you're talking about? Well, now he's he's uh, he's 19, but, but at the time when he was younger, it was uh, more of an issue. And uh, so with, he, with this model, the the you're kind of giving it that you you decide what you want and what you don't want and how much time. And just say so you said you were going to go for an hour, and you you you. When I find it's not so effective. If he would say, if he would yeah, say, yeah, yeah, I try to get them to say. I say, I don't care. I say, t- choose ten hours, but just say ten hours. Okay. At least you'd be aware of what you're doing, and then do okay. it. It's it's not easy. I I, I I think that's the you know those who grew up before have some grounding somewhere else. But there's a whole they call it the V generation. There's a whole you know, mindset now that we don't know how it's going to influence a lot, a lot of uh, parts of our society. But I think I think what you have to do is start. It's not so simple. You, the, the addiction with I have grandkids who are like three, four years old who are addicted already to, to you know to internet. Wow. And it's like really sad to see. It's really sad. The parents have to be on it. The parents can't be liberal. The parents have to say, and I have some who are not. 
the parents have to like really say, you can see, you know, at that stage, one hour, you know, and then come in and drag them out. Yeah, yeah. So we end up doing that with, with, with the girls. They say, oh, because I'm going to talk to friends in America on Telegram. And that's what I'm going to so doing, and that's it. Buy, if you buy the book, you'll get some framework out to <laughs> clarify what, what, you know, you can't tell them not to go into it, but at least give them awareness of how they might be developing the problem. Great. Nice so to meet you all. <laughs>